The Bible is a book of promises. Conservatively, there are over 7,000 promises in the Bible that can be applied to the Christian today. The Bible says about these promises in 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4, and his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Exceedingly great and precious promises. What a great statement to make about those promises that have been given to us. Now, when you look at the promises of God, most of them are conditional. Some of them are unconditional, but at least they are conditional on you following Christ, giving your life to him. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds and he who knocks, it will be opened. So the conditions are that we ask, that we seek, that we knock. And his promises that when we do seek, we will find. When we knock, it will be opened. And when we ask, we receive. God wants to give to us and he wants us to seek in the name of Jesus to be able to receive these things. Let me give you a few other examples of promises in the Bible. I love James 4, 8a, which says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Do you ever feel at a distance from God? Well, if you begin to draw near to him, he says he will draw near to you. Now, the rest of the verse says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so there may need to be some repentance in our lives as we draw near to God. But the promise still stands, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Another example of a promise that is conditional is Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How many of us feel like we are weary and heavy laden, and a promise that if we would come to Christ, that he would lift that burden up and take his yoke that is an easy yoke to bear. Matthew 12, 20 and 21, Jesus quotes from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, but he gives us this promise, a bruised reed he shall not break, and a smoldering flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice and victory, and in his name the Gentiles will trust. Again, this is a quote from the Old Testament that the Gentiles are going to trust. But the promise in the beginning, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering flax he will not quench. This is someone who is in trouble. A bruised reed is bent over and a lot of people would break it off. A smoldering flax would just be thrown away. A candle that's smoking would just be thrown away rather than worked with to be able to relight. God says he's not giving up on you. He is gonna work with you even if you are broken and smoldering. John 14, 26 is another example of a promise. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. This is the promise that if we study God's word, that the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance the things that is said and that the Holy Spirit will be with us. When I was a new Christian, I was encouraged to mark a P by every promise that I found in the Bible. I was encouraged to read two chapters a day in my quiet time, seek, pray, and then read those two chapters. And in order to get me to focus, it was suggested that I would put a P by every promise that I could find. So I would read the passage looking for the promises of God. And it was amazing how many P's I put by passages that spoke of promises that God has given us. Now, an example of one who received the promises of God is Abraham in the book of Genesis. In Genesis 12, God gives him a promise. Interestingly enough, he tells him what he has to do, but the promises are unconditional. Listen to what it says. This is Genesis 12, one through three. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. So four things he had to do, leave his country, leave his father's house, leave his family, and go to the land that he would show him. Interestingly enough, the first thing Abraham does is take his father and his nephew Lot and go to Haran. So the only part that he does is to leave his land. 
When his father dies, the Bible says God brought him into Canaan. He still had Lot with him. Later on, he would break away from Lot and be in Canaan and fulfill all of the things that God had told him. Now here's what God says, and it doesn't necessarily say it's connected to what Abraham does. He said to him after telling him to do these four things, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now this is when he leaves Haran. But God gave him all of these promises, I will, I will, I will. It was all about what God was going to do. As we are obedient to the things that God has given us, because we are children of God, because we are called by God, God begins to do the things in our life that God said that he would do. Now this example of Abraham continues on. When he gets into the land, this is Genesis 12, 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. An altar is a place you would make a sacrifice. And so when Abram got to the land, God once again showed him that he was going to give his descendants this land. Now interestingly enough, Abram means a father. And at this point he has no children. When he gets to the land, he has no kids. The next thing that happens is that Abraham leaves the land of Canaan because there's a famine in the land and he goes down to Egypt has some difficulties, but then he comes back up into the land and then God meets with him again. And he says to Abraham, I am your exceedingly great reward. And Abraham says, what shall you give me, seeing that one not born in my house is my heir? He's complaining that the promise that he would have descendants is not yet been met. And so God is patient with Abram and says to him, then he brought him outside and said, look towards the heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. So he takes him outside and gives him the example of the heavens that your descendants are going to be as the stars of the sea. Interestingly enough, Abraham is the father of the Jewish people and most of the Arab peoples. Now the promises with Abraham continue as God gives him a command to sacrifice his son. Now this is a test and Abraham does the sacrifice him. But when he goes through with it and God stops him, God gives him this promise in Genesis 22, 17 and 18. Blessings I will bless you and multiply and I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemy. In your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. He promised to Abraham that one of his descendants was going to bless all nations. We learn from Paul in Galatians 3.16 that this is Jesus. Paul says, now to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made. He does not say, and to his seeds as to many, but as to one and to your seed, which is Christ. In other words, the promise to Abraham that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him was through Isaac, through the Messiah, and then all nations of the earth would be blessed, even as we see it in our day. Now I think that we are a lot like Abraham. We hear the promises of God or we receive what God wants us to do. We partially obey and then we obey because God has helped us to be able to obey. And then we receive the wonderful promises that God has given us. Now let me give you four more biblical promises in closing. Number one, he will never leave us. This is Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. No matter what you're going through, no matter what difficulties you face, no matter how hard it is, God is with you right now and will always be with you in whatever you go through, good and bad times. Number two, and I love this, he gives us a promise to guide us. How often do we want to know, should I stay here? Should I move to another city? Should I take that new job? In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understandings. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Now this is conditional. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understandings. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. 
Don't just go out and make decisions. Acknowledge God and pray for them. Don't lean on your own understanding, but seek Him and trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And God has promised He will direct your paths. The third promise in closing is that God will forgive us. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How often have we failed and feel like God won't forgive us because we're asking for forgiveness again? But it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means he's gonna be working on us to get that sin out of our lives. The fourth and final promise is that God gives us all we need for life and godliness. This is a passage we read earlier, 2 Peter 1, 2 and 3. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. And His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. Everything we need is in the Word of God, is in the Holy Spirit that we've been filled with. We don't need anything that this world has to offer for life and godliness. It's all in Him. May we stay focused on Him. May we be like Abraham, who would respond, believe, and be given righteousness, and allow God to give us both the conditional and unconditional promises that can change our lives. We'll see you next time on Hot Topics.